So we're going to continue on in our series here, Who I Am. And now, one thing I just want to make sure that when you realize, if you're if not seen, been a part of the series at all, when it says who I am, this isn't you talking in who I am. It's God speaking who I am and expressing to us who he is. And hopefully as we're walking through this, there's a discovery about him to be made. I think we're a people in a discovery mode. We're on a journey. We're, we're discovering treasures and amazing things about who our God is. And, and I think that's so important for us as we're kind of walking this thing out is that we're just falling in love with him, a deeper, just passionate relationship. Hopefully it's similar to what you see even in your own relationships with people, whether you're married, whether you're with your children, with, with loved ones, is that the more time you spend, the more you get to know each other, the more passionate, more, more amazing your relationship becomes. And I, that's what we discover in this amazing relationship that we have with Christ that we've been invited into. And hopefully that's happening during this time. You know, last week uh, we were talking about joy and how we're not looking for situational happiness. Right? We're not looking just for a situation to make me happy, but we're understanding that the source of our joy comes in the condition we are now in, in Christ Jesus. That he's changed us and made us new, and therefore it's, it's changed how we see life, and we're full of joy and anticipation for what's to come. And, and some of that joy comes from just knowing the end of the story, and that no matter what happens on this journey, we see what's ahead of us. And it's exciting, and we're passionate about those things. But just recognizing that truly the Lord, he is the great I am, the source of our, of our joy. And so one thing this morning I just want to talk briefly about before we baptize people. And it's kind of, it'll be a nice segue, actually, into that, into that tub. And, and you might wonder what those sticks are. We, we don't beat people to get in there, right? We're not going to start whacking people or anything. They're actually holding heaters that keep that tub nice and warm, all right? So it's, it's, that's what it's for, just in case you don't, you wonder. Um, because we have an awesome system up here. We have this cow trough, and, and it's awesome just to, just to see what God does in that trough. There's a lot of people that have dipped themselves in it. We're going we're gonna, to bury three people in it today, and so that's going to be, that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, but, 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 but the source of that even is what we're talking about here this morning, is that the Lord, the who I am, is our Redeemer. We believe that. He's the one that redeems us. What we could not do, He accomplished. And to be redeemed, we must realize that we need redemption. There's things about us that are like broken, and without Christ, we're in trouble. And there's scripture verses like the one that says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So there's not some of us have sinned. We're all there. There's not one person on the planet that was sinless other than Jesus Christ. And we recognize that of all those that were before him, there wasn't anyone that was like, Oh, well, maybe the, the priests or, or these folks or, or Moses or Abraham. I mean, all of them had issues. None of them were worthy to be our Redeemer. And we have to recognize that that's just who we are. Well, were. And I love this, this passage of Scripture in Colossians. that says, and, and you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. And, and I love our condition and recognize that because of what Jesus Christ has done, we now are holy and blameless. He is our cleanser. He's the one that has made us new. I mean, I think Christianity can be defined as a people or as a, a person that has been redeemed by Jesus Christ. That's kind of who we are. Our sins have been atoned by the blood of the Lamb. And now, now when we think about the blood of the Lamb, that's kind of a weird thing for us to talk about here in 2022, right? But we're in, in the Old Testament during this time. That wasn't a foreign, a foreign conversation or an odd conversation to have. Because they understood, they understood that they had an issue, that sin separated them from God. And what the sacrifice did is it actually, it, it was a propitiation. It was a, a taking on the sin of mankind onto a lamb, onto a spotless lamb. 
And then that lamb died in our place. And it was necessary for us because we once, and I shared this a little bit this morning, we once were connected. Heaven and earth came together. There was this beautiful garden of Eden and we walked with the Lord and talked with the Lord and had this amazing relationship. And then what happened is sin came in and it separated us. But then what we've, we've seen is that all of the story of the Bible is about bringing heaven and earth back together once again. You know, sometimes we think, oh, it's all about me going to heaven. It's much larger than that, people. It's much grander what God is going to do. He's going to reunite once again heaven and earth. And we'll walk and talk with our heavenly Father. And we'll be in relationship and communion with him like we were in the garden. But even now, there's this sense of coming, there's a little bit of this overlap. And that's what we see when we see that the lamb allowed this overlap, allowed this opportunity for the, for the priest to go into the Holy of Holies once a year and atone for mankind's sin. And I want to talk a little about that um, this morning. And the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur was what it was called. It was a, a time of, of celebration and that they were going to, going to deal with the, with, with the sin of the children of Israel. And during that time, they had a ritual which was, which was of these, these two goats. Right, and, and if you haven't read about this, it's Leviticus chapter 17, and there's other passages as well. But in this, there, there's these two goats that are brought before the high priest, and and what they do is the first goat. That well, first what they do is they is they draw lots to decide which goat is the one that's going to be offered to the Lord, and which is the one that's going to be sent off, called uh, what we would call a scapegoat. All right, and so and so during this time they draw lots, and then the one is chosen. As and, and as as the Aaron lays his hands upon the goat, and, and lets the sins of the people be upon the goat, and then at that time that goat would then go to the altar and be sacrificed for the sins of the children of Israel. Then they have a second goat. This goat also would come before Aaron, and he would lay his hands upon the goat. It's called the goat of the departed, the goat that would that that would be sent off into the wilderness. To be forgotten. Is that the sins of the people were laid upon that goat. And it was sent off into the wilderness. Where it would wander never to be seen again. To be let go. To die out there in the wilderness. To, to realize that the sins are no longer remembered. There's a passage of scripture. It says, this is the covenant that I made with them after those days, declared the Lord. I will put my law on their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Which is really a representation of what we see here in Leviticus, of where the goat, the sins were forgotten. They're carried off into the wilderness to be remembered no more. Uh, like I said, you can read about this in Leviticus, you know, and it's a, a, great, a great read. You read about it in Numbers as well. But I, I think here, here's something that's interesting that I want us just to, just to think about. Is that there were two men that stood before Pontius Pilate, before Jesus Christ went to the cross. One was called Jesus, the other was called Barabbas. And if you remember that story, um, it's pretty familiar to all of us and but in Matthew 27, it says, The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they all said, Let him be crucified. And so the decision was made at that moment, which of these two men was going to be sacrificed for the Lord? Was it going to be Jesus or was it going to be Barabbas? And we recognize that Jesus then went to the cross. Now, I think one thing that's interesting is Jesus was the chosen representation of that first goat. We also see Barabbas. And, and I don't know if you realize this, but Barabbas, let me go to this, is Bar Abba, which means the son of Abba, son of the father. And at this moment, we have Barabbas who is sent off, who is released from the guilt of his condemnation to wander off away from where they were at and Jesus became the lamb to sacrifice. I, I think it's just interesting when I, when I read the Bible and read stories like this, I realize that, that Jesus did, didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets. He came to fulfill the law and the prophets. It talks about that in Matthew chapter 7, verse 17. And I think what's also important to realize in Matthew 5 and verse 17 through 20 
There's also this understanding that we don't just do away, say, hey, we can just live however we want. We don't have to do anything. Actually, within that passage of Scripture, it says, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever, this is Jesus speaking, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds the right, the, the, that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And I love this picture when we really, and, and obviously we're, we're here standing in, in the cross and the sacrifice and his resurrection has already taken place. And so we understand the power of the righteousness that comes in Christ Jesus far exceeds anything the scribes and the Pharisees or you and I could do. There's nothing we could do. But yet still, we, we look in this understanding that all the law and the prophets were fulfilled in Jesus. So we understand that in Christ Jesus is this expression of truth. And we are the image bearers of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We were created in His image. And even now, we are to be the images, the, 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 the image bearers of Jesus Christ to the world. And so the people see us, they see us as being those that have been radically changed by the good news of the gospel. And that that which Christ has fulfilled in His life, and His death, and His resurrection are now an expression of how we do life. And so it, it doesn't diminish the cross or the law or the prophets. He's not out here to say, I'm, I'm abolishing these things. I'm fulfilling these things. But in this, you are now image bearers of the fulfillment of all that I have done. And, and that's an awesome responsibility. It's an awesome mandate as Christ followers. That we live this life and just allowing the fruit of the Spirit and all that we have in Christ Jesus to be on display in the world that we, in the world that we live in. That Jesus paid that price so that we now too can walk as redeemed individuals, redeemed back to the Father. But now we carry this message of reconciliation, this message of redemption to the world that we live in. You know, David spoke these words. Actually, let me go back. David spoke these words in Psalms 19, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. David understood that God was the one to redeem us, right? And the thing is, is that we know what David even didn't know, that Jesus would be that lamb, that last sacrifice. That there were prophetic words that were spoken, but we now walk in the understanding of the good news of what Jesus Christ has done. Well, what I love is in the Bible, there's story after story that just talks about how God broke in and fought the battle, did what, what we could not do. And I think it's so important for us to realize that when we read the Bible, it's not about, look what I have done. It's like, look what God has done. Now, there's stories in, um, I think I have it in the scripture, Second Chronicles 20. Uh, and this is Jehoshaphat. Here he's facing the hordes of the Moabites and the Ammonites. And it's interesting, as I was reading this, I, I was just, I said, the Moabites and the Ammonites? I said, the, the, these are Lot's, these are Lot's descendants. Remember that story we talked about influencers and the sin of Lot that came out of after he left Sodom and Gomorrah, his daughters when they slept with him. The Moabites and the Ammonites were from that, from that sin, the incense. Well, here we have the situation. We're battling. Here he is battling these folks. And it says, Oh, our God, will you not? Execute judgment on them, for we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. You know, have you ever felt powerless? I, sometimes you feel powerless for what's happening around us. Maybe there's even things we face in, in our lives against the flesh, and we feel powerless about how are we going to defeat this thing? I know Romans 8, 37 says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We sang a song about he is our conqueror. That we're conquerors through Christ Jesus. And what's awesome, we're more than conquerors because we aren't even the ones that fight the battle. It goes on in this passage, it says, Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid, do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours, but God's. 
You will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm. Hold your position. And see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. Man, what an awesome position we're in. That that which we needed to fight, the, the stuff we had to deal with in our own selves, is that God fought that battle for us. I know, I, I'm, I'm a, I like watching movies. I don't know about any of you. Uh, anybody ever watch The Lord of the Rings? They can say, oh, I don't watch that stuff. It's like, okay, well, I, I did. All right, and so, but, but anyway, one of these movies, you, you, there's the third one. It's The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King. And there's thousands upon thousands of people, good and bad, fighting against one another. There's this incredible battle, you know, over Ministeris, the white city. And, and there's this amazing, you know, episode. And, but here's the thing. That's not what God did to redeem us. He didn't bring in all the battle, you know, worry soldiers and all of us. They come on, let's fight for us. No, what he did is that he says, hey, you know what? I, I got this. I don't need you in this. I'm going to take care of this for you. I'm going to send my son. I'm going to deal with this once and for all. I'm going to bring redemption. I'm going to pay the price that's necessary for you to come back into relationship with me. It truly is the return of the king. That our Lord and Savior came and walked among us. And what a joy it is just to recognize that he fought the battle for us. I, I read a book just recently from... Um, in Hezekiah, um, a book just in relationship to his story. And as you read his story, here's a man that decided to clean the temple, to clean the house, get rid of all the idols. And even in the midst of that, he had the king of the Syrians came against, Assyrians came against him. I, I can hardly pronounce his name. It's like Sennacherib or whatever, right? He's the king of Assyria. And he surrounds with his horde of uh, this humongous army. And because King Hezekiah said, you know what? I'm not going to pay tribute to this ungodly king any longer. So I'm done doing that. And so the king of Assyria says, well, buckle up, buddy, because we're coming to get money. We're going to come and take over your country. We're going to come and destroy the city of Jerusalem. And he surrounded the city. And you have this conversation that he has with them. Here's Hezekiah. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed before the king of Assyria. And all the horde that is with him. For there are more, this is God speaking to Hezekiah, there are more with us than with him. Or maybe, actually, this is Hezekiah speaking to the people. Um, more with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord. We talked about what that means, Yahweh. And one thing just to remember when, when Lord is capitalized in the Bible, we know what that means, right? That's talking about Yahweh. Even though, when you look at, if, you, if you look at the, at the definition of it, it'll say Jehovah. We already went through that, right, the other day, about how the word actually represents Yahweh. So, be with us, the Lord, Yahweh, our God, Elohim. He says, to help us and to fight our battles. And the people took courage from the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. And I love just recognizing what we have in Christ Jesus and in the sense of that Jesus has truly fought this battle for us. And so therefore, when we are faced with the enemy, whatever it might be, and I think more than anything, the days that we live in now, it's our flesh that we're warring against. It's our flesh that comes against us, and we have to oppose the things of the flesh. And when we do that, we can read scriptures like this to say, hey, God is the one that's going to fight this battle for me. God's, I'm already more than a conqueror because of what Jesus Christ has done, not because of what I have to do to deal with this. But I can realize I can walk into this battle against my own flesh and say, hey, you have no authority over me. That even though we can speak against the temptations that would lure us into cheating on our taxes, right? That's going to come up. There's going to be temptation here come up January, February, March. Say, hey, well, did I really make that kind of money? Do I really have to account for this? Do I account for that? It's like we say, hey, we account for it. We, 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 pay, our, we pay our dues. We're not going to find ourselves tempted to cheat something. We're not going to find ourselves temptation to steal. We're not going to find ourselves temptation to the lusts of the flesh, the things that would attract our eyes. We say, hey, that's a temptation, but I don't have to give in to those things. We can draw near to the Lord and recognize that, man, he's fought this battle for me. Therefore, I can say no to these things and stand strong against the Lord. I, I wrote this prayer down just because I thought, you know, I think when, when we're coming against the flesh, we should just stop for a minute and just say, flesh, you have come under the authority of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of me, I say to you, 
The Lord my God has fought the battle over sin, and I'm free from this temptation. Get behind me in the name of Jesus. I think that's how we pray. When we stand, when, when the enemy comes against us, we speak against him. Just like we saw Hezekiah speaking to the people and Jehoshaphat and just all these kings in, in the Old Testament that they recognize as the enemy is coming against them. We say, wait a minute. The God who is with us, that's an arm of flesh. The God who's with us is far greater, far stronger, more than able. Therefore, we speak against these things because God is our redeemer. He has fought and paid the price for us that we are free. We've been set free. We've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. That verse, which I accidentally put up earlier, you probably already read, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. What's he talking about? A yoke of slavery was the yoke of sin, right? We were slaves to sin. We've been set free from that. Now we are slaves to righteousness. I don't want to be set free from the slave of righteousness. I say, I'm so thankful for my Lord who's Lord over my life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, for, for locking me down. I'm now chained to you. I, mean, I love being chained to righteousness. I'm no longer chained to sin. And there's nothing else that man can offer that will set a person free. I don't think Judaism, Mormonism, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, humanism, Jehovah's Witness, Scientology, atheism, all the isms out there, whatever they might be, none of them will set us free. Jesus Christ, our Heavenly Father, set the one and only, the one and only Savior the one and only that would be our Redeemer. I believe that with all of my heart, that Christ is our liberator, our Redeemer. The world, the world sees Christ as an option. We recognize that. It's just one of the options out there. It's one of the many lifeboats that come along in life. We don't see that. We, we, we don't see Christ as an option. He is the only option. And that's not because I said it, because he said it, all right? It's because of Jesus Christ, he's the one that declared it, he's the one that said it. I love this passage in Galatians. I think it resonates with, with understanding how, you know, everything apart from Christ isn't going to lead us down the road to a good way of living or eternity. It, it, the, the, the world has, and I've said this, I don't know how many times, has a lot of good advice. Hey, here's a good way to live. Here's a good way to do life. Here's a good way to do this. But, but our message isn't about good advice. It's about good news of what Jesus Christ has done. And it says here in, in Galatians. Oh, are we done? I just lost. I think I'm now I'm on this. Oh, wait, there it is. Okay. It says, look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision. This is just one of the laws that he is obligated to keep the whole law. And so he's not listing every single law he's talking about, but he's talking about the entirety of the law. It says, you are severed. Listen to this. You are severed from Christ. You who will be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. Now, this is some heavy words that are being spoken here. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly await for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. And that we understand that it's through Christ Jesus, the work of Christ Jesus that saves us. It doesn't diminish the work that we put on and say, man, I thank you, Lord, I could live a new life in Christ Jesus. And there's passages upon passages of Scripture that help us to, to live life and to deal with relationships and to forgive one another and to, to battle temptation, all that stuff. Praise God, we have these opportunities to become the image bearers, being to look more and more like Christ Jesus, who is perfect in every way. And now we can walk this thing out as we are people of his presence and, and what a joy it is. But we do not want to ever try to take the place, our work, take the place of his works because that, 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 that's a dangerous place and plus it's just a bottomless pit 
that you'll never be able to fill it. You'll never be able to do enough good works, enough good things to become what Jesus Christ has become for us. That his righteousness, and we have that, is far greater than anything of the scribes and the Pharisees, the preachers, the teachers, whoever they might be. It's like his righteousness is far greater. And that's what we all have in Christ Jesus. You know, Paul here is just warning the church, the Galatians, to trust in Christ alone. To believe in him. That he's the only one that can redeem you. That we cannot be a spotless lamb. We are spotted lambs. Right? We're the blemished. We're the scarred. We're the ones that that have evidence of our sin nature and things. But we've been made cleansed and made righteous in Christ Jesus. And what's awesome is that this morning, we're going to do some water baptisms here. I'm going to walk over here. And in this, I guess someone can move this after I move over here. But um, one thing, I guess I don't need to use this. One thing that's awesome about being water baptized, it's, it's symbolic. We, we actually do a couple of, of rituals here at the church that, as, a, as a body of believers. One is baptism. And, and we see baptism in water, baptism in the Holy Spirit as this combination of, of one baptism with two expressions of it that we say, hey, like Jesus, he got baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Spirit. It was awesome. And we see that within individuals. We come in here, we say, hey, let's, let's believe God for, the, for the, that what Jesus did at the cross, that we died with him, we rose with him, we're alive with him. And now we're filled with the Holy Spirit to be his ambassadors, to be witnesses, to be a testimony, to be, to be just totally radically transformed by what God has done. And now full of the Holy Spirit to do incredible exploits. Acts chapter 2 is all about these amazing exploits that took place. Right? You guys, anybody read Acts chapter 2? Yeah, it's amazing. Worship team needs to come up here. So, and, and it's in that Acts chapter 2 that we say, or, or Acts chapter, the whole book of Acts, is that we walk this out today. Is that we, we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the washing of the water, the cleansing that our sins have been dealt with. And now as we come out, as he rose from the dead, we too rise with him. And we have a whole new life in Christ Jesus. And it's awesome that that we have some people this morning that want to, as a testimony, they want to say, hey, I, I want to let you know what Jesus Christ has done in my life. Is that I've been changed, I've been made new. Hey, Brent, you want to grab this out of the way? I'll grab this. And, and we're going to, as witnesses in this house, we're going to bear witness to their testimony, um, to their faith in Christ Jesus. Another thing that we do as a body of believers is we take communion together. Right? We do that on the first of every, of every month. And that is also symbolic of the, the death of Jesus Christ. And as we take the bread, we take the blood, it represents what Jesus Christ has done. And we never want to forget what Christ did for us. Amen? It's not something that's just, oh, yeah, it happened. Man, every day we live in that understanding. Because we want to be alert and aware that, hey, we're, we're, we're facing the enemy, we're facing challenges. And man, we have Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, that changed us and made us brand new. Hello, everyone. Thanks for watching this YouTube video. Hope we've already done this, but if not, hit the like, subscribe, ring the bell. We'd love to stay connected with you. This is a great way for out and about to make sure you remain part of what we're doing here at the River Center. There'll be another great video next week, so check it out. And hopefully we'll see you soon. Thanks.